Uh, okay, so this week, AMD put out a new technical preview for its um, fluid motion frame technology. AFMF is now AFMF2. And um, yeah, I took a look at it. I was quite impressed by it. Um, so yeah, basically you have to download a bespoke driver in order to access the new feature. And then, you know, it basically just sits within the Radeon um, uh, sort of control panel and you can activate it um, at will. And obviously you can access that control panel at any, any time, I think, with Alt-R. There's also, when you boot a game, there's a little flash in the top right-hand corner, which tells you which of the uh, Radeon features are active. Um, so let's quickly talk about what AFMF and AFMF2 actually are and why it's quite exciting. Basically, this is driver level um, frame generation, which means that in theory, it should work on any, I think it's DX11, DX12, might have been backported, I'm not sure, but definitely all modern games on DX11 and DX12 support AFMF2. And this is driver level um, frame generation. Uh, no integration needed by developer. It, it kind of just, in theory, works. Now, I had some issues with the original AFMF, um, which is to say that in areas of really fast motion, it just seemed to turn off, um, <laughs> presumably because the image quality of, you know, of interpolating between two very fast moving frames wasn't great. So they kind of just turned it off. This produced a sort of jarring effect. Um, I played a series of games with AFMF2 using a Radeon RX 7900 GRE, which is kind of like upper mid-range. Mid I was playing at 4K on Control, Cyberpunk, and um, what was the other game I did? Let's have a quick Hellblade. Look. Hellblade, yes. <laughs> well done, Oliver. Now, here's the footage that I captured. What's interesting about this is that in the bottom right-hand corner there, you'll see Revertuna Statistic Server's frame rate counter. Um, Revertuner is not aware of anything that AFMF is doing. So it's reporting the base frame rate, right? Now in the top right hand corner there, you've got the Radeon um, uh, overlay, which does accurately track frame rates with AFMF active. So you basically see at the bottom right there, base frame rate, top right interpolated frame rate with AFMF. And you know you are seeing a really appreciable multiplier there. It is typically in the 2X range. Question is, does the, the image quality hold up? And the other question, of course, is does it, you know, did I notice it turning off at all, <laughs> which was not great. It doesn't seem to turn off now. It seems to work, it seems to look really good. And you're always getting this multiplier. And for slower pace games like Hellblade 2, I mean, AMD, I think they really want you to have as high a base frame rate as possible. So the artifacts in interpolated frames don't show up. However, um, Slower paced games like Hellblade, I'm running it sort of in the mid 40s here on the 7900 GRE. This is essentially maxed out settings, 4K output, upscaling from 1440p. And, you know, what can I say? AFM, AFMF2 is taking you into high refresh rate territory. Looks great on my screen. And because it's a slower paced game, the lower base frame rate doesn't seem to have too much of an mm -hmm. issue. Um, next game I looked at, uh, Control. Um, this one is quite interesting because um, the 7900 GRE here, I could um, run with medium settings, um, but I turned off MSAA, it's not needed. And I just used the full RT feature set. And I could play this anything from what, 100 to 120 frames per second with the GRE, which is a great turnout for a upper mid-range um, GPU, full ray tracing there, everything there. And um, what can I say? You know, you can see the base frame rate there. I managed to keep it in the 60 territory. It does go a bit lower into the 50s, but you know, on a VRR screen, worked great. Um, Cyberpunk, same thing. You know, here I'm just using flat ultra settings, I believe. And um, again, the frame rate can be sort of 40s just works really well in the high refresh rate um, territory. Next thing I did was because this technology basically relies on VSync being off. I don't think you can use it with VSync on. Um, yeah, what I used 
was Reva Tuna's statistics server to limit frame rate to about 57 to 58 FPS. Uh, so once um, uh, AFMF activates, it's always going to be in the VRR window of my LG OLED. It'll always be slightly under 120 frames per second. And that worked. So yeah, what can I say? I think the quality is pretty good. Um, the frame rate multiplier is pretty consistent, looks great. Question is visual inconsistencies. Um, in control, I did notice them specifically on the kind of HUD elements, like the target reticule in the middle of the screen and fast movement has some issues there, but it wasn't enough for me to say, right, this is awful. I'm going to turn it off. I thought it was still pretty good. Mm. Um, I've shared my assets with you guys. Uh, Oliver, any initial thoughts about this? I recognize that obviously you're just looking at my footage and <laughs> have the opportunity to play it at all. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, quality of frame gen, I think it's all right. I think it looks pretty good, I think. I think not disabling it during fast movement is the right call. I would rather live with frame gen artifacts than just have that yeah. obvious difference in the fluidity from one moment to the other. I think that's a more obtrusive issue. If you look through individual frames, you do find issues, and it's not like... Uh, geez, it's not like it was with FSR 3 or like DLSS 3 frame generation where you can go through and actually find frames, many frames indeed, that are generated frames that you will know are yeah. generated frames, um, but don't exhibit uh, substantial artifacts. They can still look quite good, surprisingly good. Here, that's not the case. They tend to <laughs> exhibit very, very obvious artifacts, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. in motion... It looks okay, it looks all right. Uh, certainly the issues with the HUD elements, like you mentioned, that is a bit of a problem because you are just running this as like a post-process based off the you know game image. So yeah. that's not ideal, but it seems all right. I guess I would kind of have a more philosophical question, <laughs> which is that I wonder what the utility of bringing a game to 60 or from 60 to 120 if you don't have a motion vector based frame gen technique, because it seems like 60 FPS, especially with a motion blur, it's already delivering a pretty smooth experience. Yeah. And it is a sort of interesting trade off with frame gen where it, as it becomes more viable with a high base frame rate, it becomes mm -hmm. arguably less useful. And with AFMF, <laughs> I think here, maybe to me, at least judging from these results now, of course, I haven't played it myself, but just scrolling through this footage and watching it, I think to me, I would kind of lean towards, well, maybe we'll just keep it at 60 and just live with a little bit of, you know, not, not quite the same level of smoothness, but have a, have a perceptibly cleaner I image think, motion. Yeah. I think, you know, when you're dealing with, um, a variable frame rate, I think it does have its advantages there. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's not, you know, you're not always locked 60, are you? Certainly in this footage, you can see in control, for example, I'm going between uh, like, you know, 50 to 60 in some cases, which basically results in like 100 and, you know, 100 to 120. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd kind of much rather be in 100 to 120 even with the, with the artifacts. Right. I think it's a really interesting technology. Um, and I think what's cool about it is, you know, you don't need to use it. It's just a value added feature and it might be, yeah, there will be variable results on each game, but, you know, tailor your settings correctly. And you are always in the high refresh rate range, which for me, I think is really good. It's a good thing to have if you've got that display and it is kind of like a fallback in, in a sense, but, you know, I was just thinking about Alex's lossless scaling video where he's looking at the frame generation there. I'd say that the quality here is better. And there are going to be use cases where, you know, it holds up even on lower base frame rates. Uh, so I think, you know, I think overall it's a net win. Uh, did you look at the assets uh, sent over there, Tom? I did, yes. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's nice having you narrate over the top of them while I looked at them over them uh, just now again. So, yeah, it is... Uh, Handy, as you say, for a 45 FPS base to go up to 90. That's that's inherently useful. Um, I think there's a, there's a net win overall. Um, that target reticle, I noticed in control especially. Did you notice it? I mean, I'm going frame by frame in this, but did you notice it like, like while playing? Was it intrusive at all? Or, or do you think it's You notice passable? it for sure. There's no yeah. doubt about it. It's on really f sort of fast whip pans um, where, you, yeah. where you can see that it's, you know, it's just there. 
The issue, I see it. yeah, the issue with um, frame generation. I mean, the reason this works at all is because you know you're sandwiching interpolated frames in between uh, standard rendered frames. It's the same with all frame generation technologies. It produces like a strobe effect, where basically it's it makes the artifacts harder to pick up because you know um, the persistence of the of the interpolated frames is you know is, is pretty short. So, you know, it's, I just find it a really interesting technology that enables you to get more out of a higher refresh rate display. And um, yeah, I think, I think it works quite nicely. There are going to be instances where it doesn't work. And yeah, it's not going to sort of hold up to the same sort of scrutiny that DLSS3 and FSR3 frame generation do, because they're inherently given much more to work with. But, you know, there's a whole bunch of games out there that are never going to receive frame generation technology. And, you know, there are some interesting use cases that Alex highlighted in the lossless scaling video, for example, um, you know, emulators. It will work on those, assuming they work with the correct APIs. He was showing Killzone 2 on the PS3 emulator running at 120, which, you know, it's never going to happen otherwise, I wouldn't have thought. So there are really interesting use case scenarios for this. And um, I don't think there's anything really to be worried about with this. You know, it's, it's something you can just experiment with and have fun with. And I do think it's a worthwhile feature. And I think NVIDIA needs to take a look at this and think to themselves, maybe we should be doing this too, not just, you know, limiting, limiting it simply to, um, uh, to you know, DLSS3 proper support. It's a whole library of games out there that could potentially benefit from this. I'm not sure it should be something that, you know, is available in a console SDK that developers can lean into because, you know, historically FSR has kind of been used and abused as opposed to, you know, there's as many bad implementations as there are good implementations. And, you know, you'd worry that it would be used as a bit of a crutch. But, you know, on the PC side where, you you know, you're in control of your own experience, I think it's well worth checking out. And yes, I think NVIDIA should be thinking about doing something similar. I would be very interested to see this on a device like the ROG Ally, where right. maybe, you know, you got that VR display, obviously, there will help, help you out. But maybe you're dealing with lower input frame rates, maybe like 30 or 40 FPS in some of these games. You know, yeah, could that be I an mean, okay experience? I ran out of time. The, the ROG Ally was right here. I was charging it up to, to oh. find out. <laughs> I did try AFMF one on it and the fact that it kept turning off oh, yeah. wasn't great. Um, AMD has also added in some features here that make it uh, more performant on lower end hardware. And I suspect they've got devices like that in mind. Um, but obviously I suspect there'll be a quality hit um, if, if you're going into what is described as a performance mode. In fact, let's look at some of the notes from AMD here. AFMF2 features a new performance mode that reduces the overhead of AFMF2 to help make high frame rate gaming experiences more achievable on a wider range of devices, especially beneficial with integrated graphics cards. Uh, and it's now the supported auto setting on Ryzen processors with Radeon graphics. Um, yeah, there's a lot of other things they've done here. They've lowered input lag with uh, compared to AFMF1. And um, yeah, there's now support for borderless full screen mode. Um, ah, and it also supports games that use Vulkan and OpenGL. So there is increased API functionality there. So um, yeah, what can I say? They've also added in interoperability with AMD Radeon Chill. So, you know, what was initially a, an interesting feature, I'd now describe as a fascinating one. And definitely worth checking out if you've got a Radeon card. The technical preview is available to everyone, but it is a, like a, a branch of the existing drivers.